Hello, everyone. I'm Clay Gordon, and I'm in Larchmont, New York this morning, and my guest today is... Sean Askinosi in Springfield, Missouri. Hey, Sean, it's great to have you here. Uh, you and I have known each other now for about 15 years, if I recall correctly. It would have been almost exactly 15 years ago that you connected with me um, as you were uh, you know, trying to figure out what was going to happen next uh, in your life. Um, I don't want to go over the transition here uh, because you've discussed it in dozens of interviews other places. And I will put links to some of those interviews in the description down below. But what I want to talk about is um, first, um, our first meeting was in Ecuador during the University of Chocolate trip in October of 2005, I think it was. And um, what it was, what what you were expecting from the trip, and what you ended up taking away, I think, is you know one of the biggest uh, bits of learning, one of the biggest experiences that you came away from that trip with. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yes, you're right. It was, um, we, I sought you out in May of 2005 and you were the first, one of the first people that I spoke with, um, in the chocolate industry, um, as it existed in those days. Um, and, uh, I found you even by, I guess there was, I don't even know if Google was in 2005, but Yahoo or something. Anyway, I found you and, um, and you, you um, encouraged me because you were familiar with this trip. You had been on this trip, um, if I am not mistaken. So you, you knew the lay of the land and uh, it was on your um, reassurance that I decided to take this step and pay my money, get my passport, um, you know, I'm still trying cases at this point. I'm still a lawyer, but I'm really desperately searching for the next thing. And so I didn't, my expectations were, I mean, I was completely wide open. So I was, I was just an open um, container, just let it, bring it on, you know, whatever it is. And uh, so everything was new. I'd traveled before as a young person. I mean, I, I, you know, in college, I lived in Japan for a year. I lived in Thailand for a summer working for the American embassy um, right at the end of the Khmer Rouge. So travel wasn't new, but the whole experience in South America was new. And I, so I didn't really have super high expectations, but I felt, you know, I was um, reassured that you were there on the trip. So not only did you say, hey, this is a worthwhile thing. And then as I reflect back on that um, trip, which I do frequently, and I've written about it a lot, and is um, <clears throat> this moment. So, you know, I talked to you, finished the conversation, and then, you know, a lot of people have these conversations and a lot of people have these things, you know, like, well, should I do this or should I do that? But after the conversation, I actually took the step of spending money, committing myself uh -huh. in the future. And that is a very, very important lesson that I learned that your listeners will relate to because it's one thing to be on the phone with someone and, but then on that person, in this case, you, uh, on that person's reassurance or affirmation, when you make an investment and you make an investment both in money and in your calendar, that's when the magic happens. That's when I believe, at least in my case, the universe sort of conspired behind me to help push me along. And so, um, but, and then if you want me to talk about my big takeaway from the trip, I'm happy to do that. But, yeah, no, I, I would, I would, I would, I would like to know. Um, yeah. I mean, I will, I will share what my biggest takeaways were, but I would like to know, I mean, because, I'm going to assume that as a result of what it is you learned on the trip, you were even more firmly committed to the notion that chocolate was the path you wanted to follow. Absolutely. So the affirmations just continued to grow. And um, I, I was so <laughs> excited, you know, I mean, I was, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm sure I had probably just completed trying a murder case within a very short period of time before this trip. Um, and I was, I don't use this word very often because it really doesn't apply to me, but I was giddy. Uh, and it was, 
and and I remember, and before we went on the air here, I did look back at some photographs, and I remember first holding a cocoa pod, and I was I was holding it in the photograph like it was a baby. I mean, it was so yeah. I was so excited, yeah. you know, when we were down in um, mm -hmm. on the Pastaza River, and uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, th but the takeaway was yes, one of of yes, go forward with this business take this risk, do it. Uh, but from the, the trip itself, interestingly, it wasn't so much about the things that we learned about Coco, which we did. We learned a lot, but um, I've told you before, you know, my grandparents were farmers, just small farmers here in Southwest Missouri, cattle and uh, some crops, some row crops. But um, so the, the travel experience itself of meeting people who were somehow related to Coco or just even in Ecuador, it just gave me this feeling of connection to my grandparents. And um, I remember very, very specifically when you and I and the others were on this hike um, in the, um, on the Pastaza River with our guide, um, um, who was Achwar. Um, yep. mm -hmm. and I remember being overwhelmed in primary forest. You know, a lot of people haven't experienced primary forest and we did. And the feeling of overwhelm was I could literally take 10 steps in one direction and I would be lost forever. And, you know, I mean, just like gone and nobody would find me. And, and um, I remember this sense of overwhelm. It was a, almost like a religious experience of that I hadn't, I, I felt this sense of creation that I hadn't felt before. I mean, we were under canopy, you know, it was almost dark because the canopy was so massive and the, the soil was so thin, you know, so the, 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 the cycle of, of creation was just like right in front of your eyes, you know, and those ants that we ate, that tasted like lemons, you know, you put those little ants in your mouth and you eat them. I mean, so the, I, I, I have great memories of that trip and that experience. Not so much, like I said, about, oh, the finer points of fermentation um, from our friend at um, CRAD, but, you know, it was just a, letting the feelings happen to me. That was a new thing for me. So that was my big takeaway from the trip. What about you? Well, I remember in my first trip, so uh, for those of you who don't know, the University of Chocolate Trips to Ecuador and the Dominican Republic, so there were three trips actually, were organized by a gentleman by the name of Pierrick Schward. And Pierrick is the founder of Vintage Chocolates, uh, who originally was the importer for Michel Cuisel and Vamori in the United States. And he is the guy who gave me my first job in chocolate back in 1998. So in 2003, when he organized the first uh, University of Chocolate trip down to Ecuador, um, for me, it was a chance to take everything that I had learned by reading, right, and make the personal visceral connection with it. Um, up until that point, everything was secondhand, everything was thirdhand. And it's impossible to really, really, I think, uh, know or understand or, comprehensive, or comprehend just how complex cocoa is, just how hard the work it is uh, by farmers, how hard farmers work to collect um, to, and to process this stuff is just absolutely amazing. And how, um, how um, remote sometimes I remember, uh, yeah, just, you know, in the second trip, um, which was in 2005. So you were there and we had um, Mark Boatwright and Patricia, who were the founders of Choctaw. We had Martin Jorgensen, who went on to uh, work, open up, a, he's now running Licorice Factory. Licorice, I use there. it in one of my bars. Yeah, I know, I know you do. I, I think about the the friendships that were created during that time and the connections and the people who are on the trip and what's going on and it's really amazing. But you, you talked about walking through the rainforest and uh, having an almost religious uh, connection to it. And I totally get that. I have a couple of uh, diary entries that I wrote from those kinds of days. But you have to remember when we were in Quito, there was an ayahuasca ceremony. Mm -hmm. right? Pierrick had arranged for that. I don't think you partook in it, um, mm -hmm. but I was one of a small number of people who 
took the Iowa first time ever. I wish uh, I had, but I didn't. Um, <clears throat> or maybe it, not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it is a very, very interesting, very interesting experience. Um, it was you know, because we did it in the basement of a suburban condo, it was sort of like a teen makeout party, which was very interesting. And um, 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 and afterwards, we went into a sweat lodge where we spent six or eight hours. So the entire experience was, you know, really quite remarkable. And it took you out, took me um, out of the common every day. But I was still riding that ayahuasca edge as we were on that walk. Uh, along mm-hmm. the Pastaza, and uh, the connections and flashbacks and feeling that I have of, you know, connected with the forest, but realizing that I was an interloper, you know, and mm-hmm. the forest had been here for untold thousands of years, and my presence in it was insignificant, and it would be there for untold thousands of years afterwards. I mean, it was really, really quite remarkable. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, I think, is uh, one of the most, um, most, um, uh, memorable experiences from that trip. Um, apart from, you remember us going to see the Pink River Dolphins on the Kapawi, and then it raining. Just yes, insane. yes, yes, yeah, yes. So yeah, but just that I had never been in a downpour like that. Um, yeah, before it was really on the boats. Fun. Those boats were cool, yeah. um, and I remember waking up to the howler monkeys. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. there and and that was I'm um, just yeah, it was quite memorable. Yeah, so. Um, when you were thinking about the kind of business that you wanted to create, I mean, from the beginning, I mean, you're a man who is guided by faith, your faith. Um, did the notion of uh, Jack Stack's work, a stake in the outcome, was that part of your philosophy from the very beginning? It was part of my philosophy because I had been practicing open book management um, as a lawyer and in my law firm before starting the chocolate business. So it was just this natural progression. But what I hadn't real or what I started to consider, you know, on this trip and then, and then especially on our, on our next trip um, and, and by our next trip in 2006 um, was including the farmers in this notion of open book management mm-hmm. um, in the form of a share profit share and in, in uh, sort of transparent, um, financial disclosure to them. That all was new, but it was a very natural progression for me from the open book management practices that I had in my law firm. Well, I want to, I want to jump to that trip. So I, you know, one of the great signs of confidence and respect that you put on me was four months later, five months later, you had decided to make your first bean buying trips. We were going to go to the Choconusco region in Chiapas in Mexico and then go to uh, the Barlovento region of Venezuela afterwards. And the thing that strikes me most about those trips, although as I recounted, I have this memory of running from one end of the airport, Terminal 1 in Mexico City, after waiting for our bags from the flight from Tuxla Gutierrez to run to the International Terminal, which is, if anybody's been to the Mexico City airport, they know how far that is. And when we're running down, trying to catch this flight and get there just barely in time to get down to a Caracas, is that um, when we went to the cooperative uh, in Chiapas, um, you presented them with this notion of, I wanted, you wanted to do a first look contract. You know, here is a deposit. I want to look at this cocoa. I want to be the first person to have an option to buy this cocoa. And they were sophisticated enough in their organization to be able to go, okay, I understand why that's a good deal. And they would accept it. Uh, But when we went down to Venezuela, Um, you know, Diego, right, uh, the infamous Diego, said, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I don't want any, any cash in advance. I only want cash, but I want all of it when the, the cocoa gets delivered. Yeah, they changed that after the trip, though, okay. because what happened is we left. Uh, one, one of the most memorable airport experiences of my life. We, you and I parted ways, and I'm by myself. Mm-hmm. In, in Caracas at the airport and they separate me and the army takes me out to an airplane hangar by myself. The passengers are getting on the flight and they're, I go to this hangar and the army is inspecting luggage. I'm the only one there and there are German shepherd dogs and they have my luggage and they 
have a, a knife and they have zip tied and they pop open the zip tie, inspect my luggage, pull everything out. I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, you know, my law degree is going to do nothing here. This is not going to help me one bit. There's no constitutional right of a warrant before sir. There's nothing, you know? So anyway, they start going through everything and they, they pulled out a box of chocolate that we, or I bought when we were in the gift shop in Tapachula mm-hmm. at the airport. And it was just this wooden box and individually wrapped little truffles or whatever, bonbons. And I didn't open it up. I just put it in my luggage. Well, the dog had hit on that. And I was like, oh, this is it. I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of my life behind bars. I mean, and they start unwrapping the chocolate and they just let me go. And it really taught me a lesson about buying things in little airports. Of course, now little airports don't exist, but you know, buying things in these little airports and then going to another country, not knowing what's wrapped inside the box that you're buying. Anyway, I'll never forget that. I ended up, they ended up letting me back. You know, I got on the plane and I went on to Ecuador. But what happened is, Clay, you know, after you and I were there um, with Diego and with Pastor Javier, um, Pastor Javier contacted me through, uh, you know, uh, through that summer of 2006 and he changed up the deal. And he said, no, that they want money. They want money now. They want more money and more money. And foolishly, I sent almost, I can't even believe, even as I tell the story today, I can't believe I did this. I mean, it's like I checked my brain at the door, but I sent them almost all of the money, almost Mm $30,000. And uh, ultimately I got no beans, nothing. And they didn't send me one single cocoa bean. And what had happened is Pastor Javier had lied to me and he he'd given all of the money to, to Diego despite the fact that Pastor Javier warned me the day we left mm-hmm. he came and warned us about not trusting Diego that he had received this message from the Holy Spirit and for us not to trust him and so all months go by and and I'm thinking okay I'm going to trust you Pastor Javier I sent all the money to him he'd given it to Diego And Diego had gone off with the money and it was gone. And I got nothing out of that. No beans, no nothing. And this is right in the middle as, you know, you're waiting for equipment to arrive. I mean, you secured the equipment through Thule Corp in Guayaquil. Uh, They were shipping it from there. They were rehabilitating things like winnowers, which I believe you said they found in Brazil. You know, so Mm -hmm. you're waiting for this. You're setting up your factory. Uh, Mm -hmm. in Springfield and you know you're looking you know at Mexico and Venezuela as the sources of beans for your first couple yeah and Barlovento I mean with a ruta de cacao you know I mean we were we were there and let me let me I I know you're you're um, modest and I I want to back up just a bit so my thinking you know in talking to you about this is um I remember very specifically, you were the one when we were on this trip in the first trip, you know, in Ecuador, you brought chocolate with you. And uh, as you always do, I'm sure, even to this day when you travel. And I, I remember you offering me a taste of a Domori bar. And I, I, I was just like, oh, my gosh, this is just amazing. Mm-hmm. And uh, we sat together on a lot of the plane rides, you know, even as we were leaving Ecuador. And um, of course, I just sat through days of lectures of um, of um, the guy from CRAD in France. Um, and he was very, very knowledgeable. But, you know, I learned a lot from you on the trip, a ton, even though you weren't a paid teacher on the trip. Um, because your knowledge base was just so vast. And so as the time went on, when I got back from that Ecuador trip and remember, as I said, again, I'm still trying cases. I'm, you know, picking juries. I'm doing all this stuff. I, I was, and maybe to a lesser extent now I was, I was a very confident young man. I mean, I was like in my early forties back then, you know, and um, I, I was fearless. I, 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 you know, and I was fearless about leaving my law job and I was making a ton of money. I was at the peak of my career 
And I was going to give all that up, which I did, and you know, start this little chocolate business. I was had no fear about that, but I knew that. And and remember, folks, there was no seminars. There was no you couldn't go to workshops. There was no you know trade shows where you could go meet five hundred other people that were doing what you want to do. There was none of that. And oh, by the way, yes, you could talk to people in Europe. They were very secretive. They didn't want to talk about anything. They didn't want to help with equipment. And there were, you know, three or four of us that were starting at the same time, but I didn't know it at the time. I thought I was the only one. I didn't know about the Taza and those other guys until you told me. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, I probably can't cuss on this. But anyway, I was like, you, you know, problem. gosh, great. You know, there's other people. I thought I was the only one. And <laughs> turned out there were like three of us starting at the same time. But my point is in this, as Clint Eastwood says, you know, a man's got to know his limitations. And I did, even as a very confident, you know, 44 year old or whatever, I knew enough to know what I didn't know. And I knew without question that I needed you to go with me on those first trips because I didn't have the confidence to, not that you were going to be a translator. I didn't have the confidence that I would know what to look for, that I would know what is a quality cocoa bean. I didn't know, I, I'd seen some beans in Ecuador. That was it. And so I needed that boost of, con of confirmation, affirmation of confidence that I knew that you could lend to me, traveling with me, talking with farmers in Mexico, talking with farmers in Venezuela, um, and then afterwards, you know, sort of giving me feedback on that. It was uh, the fuel that I needed in my booster rocket to, in order to feel the confidence that I need to, to just get, you know, start this thing going. You know, I needed that um, to get from zero to liftoff, you know, and that's, that is why I engaged you and your services to help me with that. I have never regretted that for a moment. And it's why, and I'm not, you know, look, you're not paying me. This is not an advertisement for Clay Gordon, but it's why over the years, periodically I have engaged you when there has been a particularly challenging thing that I need help with or um, a, a strategy of this, that, or the other, or um, because, you know, you were knowledgeable then and I trusted you then and you over the years, you, your knowledge base has just continued to grow and grow and grow. And so I'm, I'm saying, look, I tell young people or any people, you know, who want to start a business and they are completely lacking in knowledge of that industry, please go find somebody who knows more than you do and pay them to help you. You can get an MBA at Harvard or wherever, fill in the blank, but please take the time to find people in the industry like I did with clay and, it's, I mean, I don't even remember what you charged, but I would have probably paid double because it was, wow. it was, that's, that's why. So I, I'm not trying, like I said, I'm not trying to do an infomercial for clay, but this is important stuff. And your listeners and viewers, I think can relate to this idea of just getting started and having someone in your corner that you trust. And that's the role that you played in my business. Well, I think there are a couple of things there. Uh, number one, thank you very much, uh, again, for the confidence that you've shown me. I mean, even though um, I may have known more than you, there was a lot that I will say that I learned um, during this entire process of working with you. So it was mutually beneficial. I was uh, really um, inspired um, by the commitment and confidence. I mean, I knew that when you were going into this, you weren't trying to say, well, I'm going to spend $5,000 on a grinder and I'm going to get a little tiny roaster. I mean, you committed hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment at a particular scale. I mean, you had a sense that if you were going to be successful, you need to manufacture at a certain size and you had the resources and you committed those resources. And that was unlike most of the other people who were starting up and like, unlike most of the other people who, who start their chocolate businesses today, they start very, very modestly. Uh, but you had this commitment. And also when uh, you showed up, in uh, Mexico, you had a guillotine with you. 
I mean, not many, <laughs> not many people. I mean, you know, these are 1100 euro, you know, CNC machines out of blocks of aluminum devices. And you also um, um, brought, you, you knew that when we were um, on these farms in, in um, so outside of Esquintla, this little town uh, in, on the coast in the Shokonusco area, that you took soil samples and you were going to have the soil analyzed so you knew what it was that was going on. So, you know, there was still this, this understanding and level of sophistication. But um, um, fast forward, um, you know, we had a chance to work together on your first bars. I did wrote some marketing material for you. And, but on the first bar, you had a picture of a cocoa farmer, right? And you were, and not only just a photo of the cocoa farmer, but the name even of who the farmers were, the names of the communities you're working with. How do you get from there? Um, I believe the next origin you might have started working with was the Philippines in Davao. Mm -hmm. um, and you notice that not only are you going to get engaged in a profit sharing program, but what you want to do is you want to solve a particular social problem that you saw, which is kids going to local schools hungry every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, when I think about the notion of fair trade and direct trade, um, I think the thing that is most important for me, um, most, most important than the actual you know, dollar value of what gets delivered, is about taking personal responsibility. I mean, so you, Sean, and your company, Eskimosi Chocolate, said, I am not going to abdicate my responsibility for reporting and sharing and doing all these other things with a third party organization. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I personally do this. I'm going to personally oversee it. I'm going to personally do it. But tell me about, you know, the origin of the school lunch program in Davao. Well, thank you for asking about that. It continues to this day. I first went to the Philippines in 2008. And another example of <clears throat> people ask, well, how do you find farmers? It's different in every situation. I usually use my lawyer skills that I used for 20 years in finding people. And it really is, just, it's, are you a good communicator as, and I know you have experience with this, as a journalist, you know, a journalist is doing much the same thing, you know, finding people, finding sources, asking the other person for a referral to the next and the next and the next. And ultimately I found some farmers in the Philippines. I wanted to go there because um, I knew that, <clears throat> that um, it was really the second place um, that the Europeans brought it to grow. Um, in the early 1600s after West Africa um, and taking it from South America. And I wanted to be part of the, the first export, you know, from we were the first people, we were the first American or the first anybody to export the cocoa from Soconusco. Um, um, and that was cool and fun for a while until it wasn't. Um, um, but the thing in the Philippines was, was neat because we were the first ones to export outside of the Philippines since their land reform in the mid 80s. And so that was, that was a, a, a really great experience to be part of that. And um, so found the farmers, found these beans. And I noticed we had this um, relationship with a nearby school and we'd been buying them computers and they were sort of a chocolate university. That's what we have, that's our, uh, now it's a foundation. Uh, that we have where we engage local young people, um, elementary school kids in Springfield and middle school kids and high school kids. But we also have these affiliate schools where we, you know, are partners with them. And so this was a little school um, in Davao and we bought some computers for them. But the principal, I was asking about nutrition and she said, well, yeah, it's a problem. So silly me, I, I was like, well, we can't, we need to worry about food before computers. So tell me about it. So the principal talked to me about severe malnutrition at this school. And what we decided to do is have the PTA. There's very active PTAs abroad, by the way, um, way more active than they are in my hometown because um, parents often care about their kids. You know, they'll ride a bike for an hour to get to a PTA meeting. That ain't going to happen here. And so um, they made tablia, traditional Filipino drink. It's just ground up cocoa beans into you know, the particle size that you might use for liquor and they put it in a disc and you melt it in water or milk, depending on your choice. And that's their traditional drink. So they made these units of tablia, put them on our container. So we get them, we sell this tablia 
and all the sales, not just profit, but the entire sales proceeds go back to the school monthly to fund a school lunch program. So we did this with no donations. It was just selling this um, and taking advantage of the leverage of the American marketplace because we could sell the tablia for way more than they could. And so we did this and we monitored the height and weight of the kids and school attendance and ended up with zero malnutrition at that school. We did that for five years. And then my deal with them was, look, in the beginning, we're not going to do this forever. This is sustainable. You're going to be on your own, which they are now, by the way. Then my deal with them was that school taught another nearby school how to do it. We were their partner and we supervised school number two. Now we're at school number three. That school helped teach the next school how to do it. So we're now, um, and we're fully funded. So people will say on, the, on our website, why aren't you selling Tablia right now? Because we don't need to. We've sold enough and we're funded through the spring of next year, 2021. And right now during the pandemic, even though school is closed, we have been sending money to the school because teachers are delivering food to these families who were identified by the teachers as suffering from severe malnutrition in the school. So it's not perfect, but it's the best we can do. And we have a similar program in Tanzania that we have done for years. And it's over a million school lunches that our little company of 17 people have provided since then. And we're doing it now in a preschool in the Philippines, and sorry, in Tanzania. We just built a preschool and opened it in January for 300 kids. Now, my understanding in Tanzania is that you're using a different product. You're not using tablea because it's not part of the local right. culture, but you're using golden rice. 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 Golden rice. 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 And that's not for sale either because that program is now sustainable. That school, I'm so proud of that school. It was a secondary school um, near where we get the beans. And every single kid in that school was only eating one meal a day. We come in, we sell the rice, they get a nutritious lunch. And we did that for five years. And now that school... ETA, they are doing this on their own. And so we're so proud of them. We have an after school program there for the um, boys and girls. It's called Enlightened Boys and Empowered Girls. We run the whole thing, we staff it, we pay for it. Um, and then we just opened this preschool. Now we do have a nutrition program for these little kids. And um, we don't sell rice to do that, though. We're funding all of this through donations to our foundation, um, Chocolate University Foundation. And we have a person that lives in the village for us. She's a graduate of the University of Dar es Salaam, a graduate of Empowered Girls herself. And uh, she's lived there for three years and she helps with the farmers and helps me with cocoa beans. But she also runs this program for Empowered Girls and Lighten Boys and is helping us um, with the preschool that is run by the farmers. We built the school. So we paid for this school for 300 kids, opened in January. I had one donor in the Washington DC area, a husband and wife wrote a check for the whole school. We built the school for 300 kids for drum roll, $85,000. Mm -hmm. And anyway, but the farmers, a 60 member cooperative, this is a, so cool. They are together, man. They're, they don't want more than 60 members. They've been doing this run by a woman, mom and pokey. She's on the front of our chocolate bar. They have a little subcommittee that is managing this preschool. And then they had another subcommittee that managed the construction of the school. So we're their partners, you know, we're not, you know, it's not the great white savior, like, oh, let us come in and tell you how to do it. Well, I think that's a really an interesting, really an interesting point to make. So if we go back to my original point, or one of my original points about what's fair, I mean, one of the ways I think about fair trade is that people in the global north or developed countries um, imposing a set of values on people in the global south or underdeveloped countries right um, and forcing them to pay for the privilege of being a part of accepting those values mm -hmm. and then not accepting the market risk for it mm -hmm. right? so one way to you know one way to think about the worst forms of institutionalized fair trade um, is that it's a form of economic colonialism Yes. Uh, thank you. Amen. Yes. Yes. Um, please. And I think that um, if I if I take a look, I mean, certainly one of the lessons. So in 2003, I went to Ecuador. 2005, I went to Ecuador. 2007, I went to Belize and I visited the Toledo Cacao Growers Association. I mean, this is this is when Gregor Hargrove, who was working for Green and Blacks, was 
working down there on a daily basis. I mean, the TCGA was, I think, the world's first fair trade and organically certified co-op um, in the world. Uh, and um, then um, by that time, I had also been to Mexico and Venezuela. But in 2010, I went to Bolivia and I expanded my horizons. And one of the things that the Bolivia trip taught me more than anything else um, is that what I knew about the cocoa culture of Bolivia did not translate to next door to Peru. And what I knew about the cocoa culture mm. of Peru did not travel um, next door to Ecuador, even though they're adjoining states. Yeah. I think that one of the things that's interesting for me is that rather than saying, um, this is what we're going to do for you, right, you responded to uh, an emergent need that came out of um, your experience in the right. Philippines. And right. then based on that experience, you found another way to do a similar kind of thing um, in Tanzania. I mean, mm -hmm. the same, same yes. goals, but culturally sensitive, <clears throat> situation dependent uh, approach yes. and result. Oh, approach yeah, there's and result. a word. The word we use for that is mutuality. That's right. what it is. It's mutuality. And it's really interesting because mutuality is one of the definitions which can be extracted from the word fair right mm -hmm. uh, another definition is plays by the rules or follows the rules yes right? which i think is the more common definition of fair you follow the rules it's fair mm -hmm. right yeah it's sort of like the, the notice of duties you have to buy into duties you have to agree to take them on you just can't be they can't be forced upon you mm -hmm. right uh, um, we're, we're now getting, yeah. we're now getting into this really interesting, I mean, I've been doing a lot of work, um, in research during this time, as I think about writing my next book, um, around, um, how do you, you know, about concepts and logic and argument and research and to make it interesting to me, I focused, I didn't want to do this in the abstract. And so I've been doing a lot of deep dive into um, Christian apologetics and counter apologetics uh, because it's, it's, you know, there are lots of examples of people debating the issues and there are lots of examples of people framing the issues and there are lots of examples of logical syllogisms. And so it becomes a really interesting lens to start thinking for me to start thinking about this concept of what is fair, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I know that these are ideas that inform, I mean, whether or not you think consciously, I am, I don't know, I am guessing, I am inferring, mm -hmm. right? That these are thoughts that you have on a daily basis that inform what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, That's am right. I, am no. I wrong there? You are, you are, you're right. And um, so in context, right before um, I would have been, you know, I found you toward, let's call it the end of the five year period where I was searching for my next passion and inspiration. But at the beginning of that five year period, um, not for any reason that we're ta we talked about here, but I started going to Assumption Abbey uh, Monastery, which is about an hour and a half from my house in the middle of the Mark Twain National Forest. These are Trappist monks. Thomas Merton was a Trappist. Um, and uh, they're cloistered, so they live in community together and basically don't leave. They make fruitcakes to support themselves. Uh, um, and I started going there as a retreat guest, and uh, my father had spent his last night there before he came home and died of lung cancer when I was 14. And so I thought, I think I'd like to go to this place where my father was his last night on this planet. And I was very attracted to this place and it's a holy place. And so I started going there, going there and keep going back. And I had a spiritual director there who's now 90 and I write about him in my book, Father Cyprian. And I, I then six years ago made this commitment to move from the guest house to the cloister. So I became a family brother. It's not, I'm not a monk. It just means that I make a commitment to live by something called a rule of life, sort of loosely based on the rule of Benedict that I write myself that's approved by the monks. And when I'm there, I stay behind the cloister in a cell. Um, 
with the monks and I follow their daily schedule. I get up at three o'clock in the morning for the first prayer service and do manual labor. And um, so I just in February took what's called a life vow or a final vow um, to become basically a lifelong family brother. Um, and I will be buried there um, at the monastery. And um, so, or my ashes will be buried there. And this is a, this is a, so it's a big part of my life and the life of prayer and meditation and contemplation um, and action um, go together. And you're right. So that's 20 years now that that's been, so uh, the, the sort of context is you, I've been going to the Abbey, you know, and then I come to you and our paths cross and then, so even today, you know, and now there's a continual sort of unfolding of the way this business, the cocoa business for me and my relationships with farmers and uh, even during the pandemic, you know, I've been going to these places for 15 years. This is the first time I've never not gone to see them, you know, so it's been very weird. And, um, but good in the way, you know, I got 15 years of going to see them. So they're like, don't worry, Sean, you know, it's okay. And they're checking on me, you know, they want to know if I'm okay. And so that's been very gratifying. But what I mean is what I'm trying to say by this is that, that uh, in a, in a very Buddhist sense and also really a Christian sense, nothing stays the same with this business with my relationship to the business, um, it's all changing. It's constantly changing. In the moment that I try to hold on too tight to the way it was last year, or the year before, I'm screwed. And likewise, the moment that I'm reaching for something the way I want it to be, then I'm I'm messed up too. And so that's why, you know, I've not said, "Oh man, I need this business to grow 10x," and I need to have more farmers and more origins and more chocolate bars and even more children that we could feed or, you know, I'm not, I want to do it in mutuality with the farmers as their partners. This has become much more, um, it has flourished much more in Tanzania for a variety of reasons, because as you said, the culture is not the same in every cocoa country. It's just not. You and I know that. Uh, and so this is a very long answer to your question to say, yes, it does inform my daily, it does inform my daily life in a, in a really big way. Well, one way that I would, um, um, one of the things that's come to me is I, what I've done is I've been trying to create a, uh, an understandable definition for sustainability, right? That it's not just because it's certified as sustainable, the two are not synonymous. And something which is a lot easier to understand than the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, because those are really complex things. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the, I have five pillars having to do with environmental, economic, and social sustainability, um, and then add the notion of market sustainability, because if you don't have people who are willing to pay for this, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. right? Why do this if you know, you're not sustainable as a business? And also um, the fifth one, uh, the fifth final one is resilience, right? That you need to create systems that can adapt to change. I mean, if you only have one way of approaching the market and the market says, sorry, you know, we're not gonna do it. Um, so you have a general idea about what you want to achieve, a general idea about how you might want to achieve it. But then the specifics get very, very different as you begin to encounter the differences in culture. And this mutuality aspect of it is so important. Um, I will do good by, I will be, do well by doing good. You will be well by, uh, all of this stuff happens and it informs, I think it is this mutuality, which is what is lacking from most aid programs. Yes, but if I could, I just, want, I just want to interject one thing. I want to, because I want to say the do well by doing good. I have, <clears throat> Since I've written the book, I do have some fairly new notions on this idea. And I think what you're saying is very important because I think we need to define 
it's important for us to define what doing well is. And many people have thought, me included, and I thought, oh, well, I don't have to sacrifice profit if I'm doing the right thing. And if I'm doing, you know, I do some feeding programs and I bring kids to Tanzania and I'm doing all these stuff that we just talked about. Well, I don't need to sacrifice profit. I thought that. Well, guess what? Yes, 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 I do. Yes. I'm done with the whole notion of this form of capitalism where we think that we can have it all. All being defined as money too. Oh, don't forget, I need to make it. I mean, because we could have a whole other episode on how the value of my business, Ask an OC Chocolate, the valuation. You know, as I think about retirement, I don't even know what that is. But, you know, of course, the thought is, Cross my mind as it would anybody that's like, well, you know, I wonder what my business is worth. Well, I am here to tell you that it isn't worth what I thought it would be. And part of the reason it isn't is because I haven't grown it the way the dominant capital culture expects me to grow it. People are like, oh, well, that's so cool that you're feeding kids and that you're building a preschool and that you're friends with the farmers. That is so nice. Good way to go. But I'm sorry, you know, we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to value this as the way we would treat. And I'm like, you know what, that was a hard pill for me to swallow clay. And I have swallowed it in the last couple of years. And it has been, it has the, the, the insight that I've had has been a result of my faith mm. in that I must be willing to accept the, the wonderful experiences that I've had in this business, starting with when you and I were in Ecuador and we had this similar kind of experiences, we're hiking through the jungle, all the way to you know me seeing the preschool in August when I was in Tanzania that was just getting ready to be opened. It was a truly divine encounter to be able to see this building made of mud bricks and I'm not saying that there's this either or, you know, mutually exclusive thing. But what I'm saying is I believe there's a very, very real possibility that if I had just fallen to the way of dominant capital cult, capitalism culture, that I might not have had those experiences. And so I am telling you, as we sit here, that I would not give those up for any valuation that somebody wanted to put on my company. I would not give them up. Never. Right. And even if you did have them, you would not have valued them yes. in the same way. Yes. Right? And I think that, I mean, as we think about the current global pandemic and the kinds of issues that are represented by rethinking things like over policing, the inequality, which is a so, which has been visited on us yes. by this, you know, you know, I'm a privileged white male. Who am I to talk about this? You know, right. it's like, Okay, I, it's not my lived experience on a daily right. basis. And yet as a human, I can be empathetic, right, to this. And I see suffering, right? And I don't want that to happen to me. And so my behavior is going to change in a way so that I don't want these things to happen to me. And I think that one of the opportunities um, that we have as we rethink what it is that's going on, as we come through the other side of this, we'll be in a sort of near normal sometime in the next six months for two years and we don't know what that near normal looks like and then there will be a new and very different normal on the other side of that we don't know what that looks like mm -hmm. but i think that changing what we value right and why we do what it is that we do um, is really i think one of the most important lessons that if we give ourselves the opportunity to reflect right um, could become one of the ways in which the world has changed um, going forward. Um, it's a, the, yes, it's it's called evolution of consciousness, and that's what's that's what's that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's what it's what happened. It's what happened to you in the jungle on our trip. It's what happened to me. It's what happened when we went even to Venezuela. It's what I mean. This is what's happening, and part of it is this insight that you speak of. Um, when you witness suffering, uh, really, it's no different than your experience in the jungle. When you said, you know, that you felt connected to the forest, 
in the same way that now, today, in 2020, you feel connected to this human being who has been treated in a way that is despicable, you know, who is suffering of, you know, centuries of inequality. And you and me and others, we are experiencing this evolution of consciousness. This is, this is the change that's happening um, before our very eyes. And I think that's a, an interesting place to stop this part of the conversation. I'll take a date to get back and do this again. I would love to have a follow-up conversation. Thank but what you. I do want to say is in the description below, I will put a link to the Talk uh, University Foundation if people want to support the work that you're doing. Right. And I will also put an Amazon affiliate link to the book so that anybody who is looking for something else to read <laughs> um, while they are uh, quarantining in place, they'll have an opportunity to do so. So Sean, I really, really do appreciate what it is uh, that you've done um, and value the friendship uh, that we've had over the course of all these many, many years. We could go back and list your forecasts and predictions from 15 years ago and just tick the boxes. They have. They have. And so, you know, um, I'm not saying you're like Nostradamus or anything, but I'm just saying. I am, I am exactly like Nostradamus. <laughs> yeah.